Hi everyone. La Santa Maria, alternatively La Gallega, was the largest of the three Spanish ships used by Christopher Columbus in his first voyage across the Atlantic Ocean in 1492, the others being the Niña and the Pinta. Her master and owner was Juan de la Cosa, a man from Santonia, Cantabria, operating in South Spanish waters. Requisitioned by order of Queen Isabella and by contract with Christopher Columbus, whom de la Cosa knew previously, the Santa Maria became Columbus's flagship on the voyage as long as it was afloat. Having gone aground on Christmas Day, 1492, on the shores of Haiti, through inexperience of the helmsman, it was partially dismantled to obtain timbers for Fort Navidad, Christmas Fort, placed in a native Taino village. The fort was the first Spanish settlement in the New World, which Columbus had claimed for Spain. He thus regarded the wreck as providential. The hull remained where it was, the subject of much modern wreck hunting without successful conclusion. There is less certainty about flagship name than for the other two ships. Columbus's Journal of Navigating for the First Voyage frequently refers to the Pinto and the Niña by name, and often asserts that they were caravels, but it never refers to the flagship by name. The surviving journal may contain flaws. The original journal, sent to the monarchs of Spain, did not survive, but an abstract by the historian, Bartolomé de las Casas, did. The historians offer two names, Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo y Valdez calls it Gallega, Antonio de Herrera y Tordesillas, Santa Maria. One solution to the conundrum is that the ship began under de la Cosa as Gallego and was changed by Columbus to Santa Maria, but there are other theories as well. Moreover, La Gallega can be taken as the Galician, suggesting that the ship was constructed in that province and was named after it. In the absence of proof, scholars can only speculate. Design of the ship Santa Maria was probably a medium-sized carrack, about 58 feet long on deck, and according to Juan Escalante de Mendoza in 1575, Santa Maria was very little larger than 100 toneladas, about 100 tons, burthen and was used as the flagship for the expedition. Santa Maria had a single deck and three small masts. The other ships of the Columbus expedition were the smaller caravel-type ships Santa Clara, known as La Nina the Girl, and La Pinta, the Painted. All these ships were second-hand and were not intended for exploration. Nina, Pinta, and the Santa Maria were modest-sized merchant vessels comparable in size to a modern cruising yacht. The exact measurements of length and width of the three ships have not survived, but good estimates of their burden capacity can be judged from contemporary anecdotes written down by one or more of Columbus's crew members, and contemporary Spanish and Portuguese shipwrecks from the late 15th and early 16th centuries which are comparable in size to that of Santa Maria. These include the ballast piles and keel lengths of the Molasses Refrack and Highborn K wreck in the Bahamas. Both were caravel vessels 62 feet in length overall, 41 feet keel length and 5 to 16 to 19 feet in width, and rated between 100 and 150 tons burden. Santa Maria, being Columbus's largest ship, was only about this size, and Niña and Pinta were smaller, at only 50 to 75 tons burden and perhaps 49 to 59 feet on deck. History of the First Voyage At the Pleasure of the Queen On the 2nd of January 1492, the last remaining Muslim stronghold in Spain, Granada, fell to the armies of the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella. They began making changes in the direction of cultural unity. The Muslims were encouraged to leave for North Africa. The Jews were given a choice, convert to Catholicism or leave the country. The Spanish Inquisition had already been instituted in 1478 to detect hypocrisy. Roman methods of interrogation were still in effect, which always involved torture, even if the suspect began by confessing everything. The new Christians were never arrested. The Jews who converted, called conversos, 
were often welcomed into high places with open arms, so to speak. The Grand Inquisitor himself, Thomas de Torquemada, was of a converser family. On the other hand, those who professed Catholicism, but practiced or seemed to practice Crypto Judaism, were called Miranos. These lived a life of terrible fear and secrecy. In the conclusion of their affairs at Granada, the monarchs dismissed Christopher Columbus, who had been at their court for six and a half years petitioning for support for an expedition to discover a great circle route to the Far East regions of India, which would entail a voyage due west over the deep and unknown ocean. Paying him for his time and trouble, they dismissed him and his suite for good and all, they thought. They had nothing against his being Italian, as he professed Catholicism also, but their Spanish advisers had condemned the idea as unprofitable. No sooner had he departed from nearby Santa Fe, the temporary capital, than Luis de Sant Angel, a converso in the position of royal treasurer, and some other friends of Columbus, convinced the Queen that great risks could bring great profits at a minimal cost on this expedition. Columbus was summoned from the road only four miles away and was unexpectedly given the support he had been denied all this time along with command of the expedition and the permanent rank of admiral and governor of all lands he should acquire. He was to receive 10% of all portable valuables he would acquire, but not until he had acquired them. Meanwhile, the queen would stand the expenses, for which she said she would pledge her duels for collateral, if necessary. The promise of Isabella to pay was really the assertion that she would create an obligation for her subjects to pay. Meanwhile, she had to conform to the protocols for borrowing money, such as putting up collateral. Possession of such collateral would never be demanded. The jewels were never at risk. The voyage was principally financed by a syndicate of seven noble Genovese bankers resident in Seville. Hence, all the accounting and recording of the voyage was kept in Seville. This also applies to the second voyage, even though the syndicate had by then disbanded. Cuba and Hispaniola According to a glowing letter sent by Columbus to his chief supporter, Luis de Santangel, in February 1493, from the Canary Islands, Cuba was the fifth island renamed by him, its new name being Juana. This time the name did not prevail over the native name, Cuba. However, Columbus's order is a simplification. He visited many more small islands, investigating everything everywhere. Striking the north coast of Cuba, he sailed westward, going around the west end of the island. Then he sailed eastward and southward. Clinging to the belief that he was in the Far East, he at first supposed he was off Sapongo, Portuguese name for Japan which supposition was recorded in the journal. By the time of the letter, he had changed it to Cathay, or China. While skimming the coast of Cuba from bay to bay, the ships were visited by many native vessels of lifeboat and galley styles. The natives invited them to visit their villages ashore. He found the natives comely and friendly. They were under a pyramidal tribal structure, were polygamous, wore no clothes, painted their bodies, and wore jewelry, rings, bracelets, anklets, necklaces, some of which were made of gold. Furniture was often elaborately carved in the shape of animals with golden eyes and ears. They were all helpful, wondering at the Europeans. Inquiring as to the source of the gold, Columbus was told that it was produced on, and traded from, the island of Boeo. On the 5th of November, the crews collected large amounts of spices that were very expensive in Europe. On the 6th, they were invited to a feast in a mountain village of 50 houses, 1,000 population, who thought the Spanish were from heaven. The Spanish smoked tobacco for the first time. On the 12th of November, they began to detain native visitors to the ship and kidnap natives on shore, planning to carry them back to Spain. Many would be sold into slavery there against the express orders of the queen. The natives were so credulous that one father whose entire family had been kidnapped begged to be taken also so that he could share heaven. It was at this time that the reputation of childishness and simplicity became attached to the natives, whom the Spanish called Indios, Indians. He wrote to de Sant'Angel, they are so unsuspicious and so generous with what they possess, 
that no one who had not seen it would believe it. On the 21st of November the fleet set course for Boyo. Natives aboard the Pinto told Columbus where it was. They must have known a great deal more not told to Columbus, as the master of the Pinto decided to go gold hunting on his own. After a confrontation with Columbus the Pinto weighed anchor and disappeared. On the 23rd of November the Nino and Santa Maria reached Boyo. Shipwreck The wreck did not occur on any planned return trip, as though the mere discovery of new lands was enough for the great explorer. On the contrary, Columbus was on a hunt for portable valuables, having already claimed the entire region as the property of Spain, even though it was inhabited by a populous trading and agricultural nation. That nation was told nothing of Columbus's intent. The main commodities that he was now seeking were gold, spices, and people, in that order. On the 24th of December, 1492, not having slept for two days, Columbus decided at 11 p.m. to lie down to sleep. The night being calm, the steersman also decided to sleep, leaving only a cabin boy to steer the ship. A practice which the admiral had always strictly forbidden. With the boy at the helm, the currents carried the ship onto a sandbank. She struck so gently that it could scarcely be felt. The obstacle was not a shoal, but a bar protruding above the surface, a beach, and waves with audible surf. The ship was making way into the ever diminishing shallows and becoming embedded more and more deeply in the sandy bottom. The boy shouted. The admiral appeared followed shortly by the captain. Under orders of the admiral to sink an anchor astern to impede the drift, the captain and seamen launched a boat. As the relationship between the admiral and the captain and crew was never very good, the admiral had commandeered the captain's ship, the admiral remained forever recriminatory about what happened next. Disregarding the admiral's orders, the boat rode to the nearby Nina, the admiral says, to ask for rescue. Shortly they turned back accompanied by a boat from the Nina, the idea being, perhaps, that the two boats might tow the flagship back to deeper waters. The Admiral claims that the renegade crew was denied permission to board. The Pinto was nowhere in sight. The ship ran aground off the present-day site of Capaetian, Haiti. Realizing that the ship was beyond repair, Columbus ordered his men to strip the timbers from the ship. The timbers were later used to build a fort which Columbus called La Navidad, Christmas, because the wreck occurred on Christmas Day, north from the modern town of Limanod. Santa Maria carried several anchors, possibly six. One of the anchors now rests in the Musée du Ponteon National Aetian, Mapana, in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. The number of men left at Fort Christmas must be about equal to the complement of the Santa Maria. The ones left would not necessarily have been crewmen of the Santa Maria. They were very likely volunteers, with the crew of the Santa Maria filling in for them. The Nina went on Columbus's attempt to explore the coast of Cuba on the second voyage. Columbus had each man of his fleet of three interviewed as to whether he thought Cuba was mainland Asia, and make an affidavit. Replicas. So-called models. Replicas or reproductions of Santa Maria and her consorts are not models, replicas or reproductions, since no plans, drawings or dimensions of them exist, they merely represent what some naval architect, archaeologist, artist or ship modeler thinks these vessels ought to have looked like. There is one sense in which none of the replicas replicate an ancient ship, the concessions to the conveniences of the modern world, especially on the ships meant actually to sail. These are well hidden, it might be an engine, or modern rudder machinery in a closed compartment, or communications equipment. No modern sailors are expected to undergo the hardships of a 15th century voyage. They have bunks where Columbus's sailors slept on the deck, and modern stoves instead of cooking fires on the deck. In case of emergencies, help is a radio call away. The Renaissance seamen risked life. They feared going to sea, and if they did go, feared to get out of sight of land. Thanks for watching.